Hey, good morning again. Thank you all for coming. Maybe we'll start a little early or on time, so we can be done on time and go to work. So it's a great pleasure to be here again today. I think it was about a year ago that uh, I came for the first time here. And uh, that was obviously a fateful meeting. I'm still around. so. And uh, it's been a great fun. I've been here for almost five months now, as many of you know. And um, one of the main things uh, that um, we do on the clinical side of things and on the research side of things as well is doing a CTO-related intervention and work. So I'll go over some of the newer things happening in the last year and see how they relate to um, our practice as well as a general development. These are my disclosures. And for those of you who are not um, routinely engaged in CTO work, CTOs stand for chronic total occlusions, and these are 100% blockages that have been there for three months or more. You're going to ask me, how do you know it's been three months? Well, many times you don't, and you assume based on when the patient started having symptoms, based on the previous angiogram in those patients who have them. But for many of them who have angiograms in the past, I can tell us how long they are. There are many things about the new. However, in this field, as in most other fields, what is most important quite often is not the newest and latest, but are the standard things. And the same is true for CTO intervention. And one of the main things that is underemphasized is the importance of studying the angiogram. Like everything else, this is a field that requires a lot of planning and a lot of uh, decision making before and after. And the best way to have good success and low complication rates is actually to spend a lot of time preparing and looking at the angiogram. We actually, one of the nice things being here is now um, have access to a world-class uh, CT group. And uh, we had several conversations with, our, uh, with um, Dr. Lesser, Dr. Long, about some of the complex cases who have been incredible, incredibly for trying to plan those procedures because CT can tell you calcification, tortuosity, and which places to go. The other two things, apart from the careful review, is doing what's called a dual injection, which I'll show you in a minute. But essentially, unlike most interventions in which we inject from one side of the coronary arteries, in this particular case, we inject from both arteries. The reason being that one artery is occluded, the other artery supplies what's called collateral to that artery. And the third component is always use what's called a microcaster over the wire system that essentially supports your wire and helps you get through. The other basic important thing is being very careful to radiation dose. This is from Progress CTO Registry that is coming to uh, here to Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. And I'll tell you more. But essentially, this is, uh, these are nine very experienced centers in the United States. These are pretty much the top operators in the country. And you can see, although all of them achieve pretty high success rates, there is a tremendous variation in how much radiation they use for each case. And part of this has to do with equipment. I'm very excited we're upgrading to a new cath lab. But apart from that, there's a lot of things that one can do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of when to press the pedal, being far away, minimizing the angulation, to be able to reduce or eliminate some of this uh, variability and reduce the overall dose for the patient as well as the operator. Another thing that's very important for this is having everything together, having a cart which has all the equipment together, and also have an algorithm or a procedural plan on how to attack those lesions. This is called the hybrid algorithm. Actually, Dr. Burke and uh, several of us got together several years ago, almost five years ago now, and created an a outline of how we thought this should be approached. At the time, there was no data to support it. As I'll show you, five years later, we now have an increasing pool of data supporting use of this approach for CTO PCI. So how can you, can you do uh, what we do? And I'm showing some things. There's clearly not enough time to show everything that's happened in 2017, but um, I'll show you some of the newer developments. And those have to do with the microcatheters. These are essentially spaghetti tubes through which our wires go through. And the tendency has been to get smaller and smaller. So these are some of them. One is a Caravel, one is a Turnpike. We used one of those last week in a case with Dr. Burke. And uh, the advantage of that, it can go places that the previous generation microcatheters could not. Uh, we used for the first time here in the U.S. actually a few weeks ago this microcatheter that's been um, very good in getting through tight occlusions. This is another kind with prolonged length that can help us as well. We do have devices like this which are support catheters. What they do is they have a nitinol mesh that expands against the wall of the artery 
And then by doing that, it gives us extra support to push our wires, microcatheters, and different equipment. This is another version of this called the Prodigy. And this is another version called the Novacross. There's an ongoing study of this going on right now, which we hope to be part of the next generation of this device here at MHI. How about guide wires? End of the day, the way you open these blockages is you advance a wire across the occlusion, and then you do your typical balloon sense. And we now have an increasing array of such wires. These are some of the not as new as much, but increasingly being used. Look at Progress CTO, and there's been a rapid uptake in the last year or so. We also have some new generation wires um, that have polymer and they are tapered tip. So there are many different options for going retrograde, for going undergrade, and trying to recanalize those occlusions. And this is the current algorithm which is used, which for you, obviously, you don't have to worry for most of you. But essentially, we are changing rapidly in which equipment we use to be able to recanalize this. Despite that, and I know that Sonia has been tormented by me in the last few months trying to get all this equipment. Despite that, most of the time, we do use a pretty limited uh, array of equipment, like the filter XT wire, the Gaia's wire, the pilot wires, and some wire for externalization. So although there is a lot of them, typically we use a limited selection of those equipment to recanalize our occlusions. There is now, um, as you know, the absorbable stent, absorbable scaffold, which can be completely absorbed. Data is still out on there, but it's been increasingly being used, including in CTOs. Some people believe it's a good thing. Some people believe it's not a good thing. But definitely something that will be expanding over time. There are balloons like this that can help um, essentially flare the ostium when you have these osteal occlusions and make it easier to get back in once you go back. There are devices like this one called the trapper balloon that helps you secure the equipment in place so it can come out in and out without losing your guide wire position. And there's hemodynamic support. And one of the things that has been a revelation for me being here is working very closely with the advanced heart failure team, you know, Dr. Ekman and the entire team. And um, it's been a revelation about what can be done when there's teamwork. This was an example. This was a patient who came from the Oklahoma VA. He was a failed twice procedure, fairly young man with um, uh, multiple previous bypasses that had one bypass open to a diagonal and nothing else was open. And um, nothing would be canalized. You can see the left main essentially was completely occluded. So he was sent here as a last ditch effort to see what can be done for him. And when we looked at it with Dr. Burke, we thought that it was a mistake accepting him. In any case, we were very fortunate that um, actually Dr. Cabouillet was on the heart failure service at the time. And he spent a lot of time you know, planning with the patient, doing a lot of testing before. And we ended up doing a procedure putting the patient on ECMO. And by doing that, we were able to go down that last remaining vessel of his, which was the Lima, which obviously is a quite risky thing. But having ECMO on board did help us stabilize the patient and be able to go retrograde for this guide wire. And then uh, we're able to advance it all the way back and essentially create a rail. And to our pleasant surprise, when we did that, there were actually vessels in this patient. We were not we hadn't seen that much. But after we did this, now you see a fairly large circumflex is lighting up. And uh, we were able to recanalize um, the occlusion. I just spoke with the patient uh, last week. He's had a remarkable uh, improvement in his quality of life. He has much less angina. He's able to do many more things. And again, this is the whole goal of this, is to be able to, first and foremost, improve the patient's quality of life. I can tell you, I don't often get people, families crying or hugging me in the recovery room, in the consultation room. But these are the patients where you go back there and you do have a, a lot of emotional response. These are very limited people with very limited options. And when things work out, they're extremely grateful themselves and their families, of course. Other techniques, this is a technique called the e-card, or electrocautery assisted re-entry. And this is one way for canalizing these occlusions that have essentially no stump. There is nothing left on the aortic core. And the problem here is it's hard to penetrate because there's so much you can push. So what was done is they took the electrocautery, plugged it on the back end of the wire, and then pressed on the bovi and was able to burn through that last part of the right coronary occlusion, essentially pushed the wire back all the way into the aorta. 
Now, if it goes in the right place, this is great. But if you burn in the wrong place, and looking at CT, there are many structures around that area, that may not be as great. So uh, obviously, this is something to be done with great caution and ideally with uh, TEE guidance. And that's another area where it's extremely important to have a good interventional um, imaging expertise so it can guide you about where to go. We haven't done this here quite yet. We were close to the last week. but. Um, it's something that definitely will be developing and another tool in a material for these procedures. These are other techniques uh, to get back out. This is a patient that you go what's called the retrograde, essentially going backwards from the uh, collateral vessels, trying to get from the proximal right coronary into the undergrade guide catheter. And this technique developed by an Italian group led by Mauro Carlino, a very creative and inventive interventionist. I think Mediterranean is a hotbed for innovation, maybe the weather or the wine, I don't know what it is. But we can try to change that. I Minneapolis in the summer can be very, very good too. So they were able to do this technique where they push and pull. So one operator pulls the balloon back, the other operator pushes the wire, you can see this interaction and then everything goes back in. This is great success if you do that, you can put balloons, stents, and the patient can have a nice result. This is another one, it's actually from um, a course I was in Dallas uh, last month, and this is called the rendezvous technique. Essentially, it's putting a retrograde wire into this undergrade microcatheter. This is um, like trying to stick needles in a haystack. It's fairly hard to get the wire to go in there, but occasionally it works, and when that happens, obviously, that's very gratifying. There are techniques like the mother-daughter granddaughter technique for guideliner. The interventional group doing this, as you can imagine, is a little creative in the naming as well. And this is one way for going way down in the coronary artery. Sometimes it's hard to go all the way down and have enough support. And what was done in this case is you have this little caster coming into the coronary. And then a second one of those, smaller one, goes all the way down. So you have one catheter, second caster, all the way down there. Being able to go through all these turns and twists to get to that spot and be able to deliver the stent and recanalize the vessel. We also now have algorithms, and the specifics here are obviously specialized, but the, the idea is that when you do these procedures, you don't want to be improvising on the go. You want to have an array of things you can do. For example, for a lesion where you don't understand where it starts, and that's not uncommon in CTOs. You want to have ways that you can try to clarify where the lesion actually starts, because of course, if you start pushing wires and balloons in the wrong area, that can be very dangerous. So having all these techniques, angiogram, intravascular ultrasound, subintimal techniques called move the cap or the retrograde approach. Having all these options and going through them in a systematic fashion can help you go through these uh, complex um, lesions. This is an example of a patient who had a right coronary CTO. It's a little hard to tell where exactly the lesion starts. You can see a lot of little branches coming off even if you don't do interventions. This is not a clear cut area where those lesions start. And these are different projections, try to understand. And still, we don't understand exactly where, which is the vessel. Is it this, the branch, another branch, another collateral? It's very hard to understand where all these things are going. So one way to try to, to resolve this is essentially create a dissection in the vessel, break the vessel, and get access to what's called the subintimal space. So we have a balloon here. And then by doing that, we have now a dissection in the vessel, which normally would be a very bad thing because you're injuring the vessel. But in this particular case, it was a good thing because we were able to go around that area of occlusion with what's called a loop, and then uh, go all the way down around an old occluded stand, and then place stands and recanalize the vessels. So there are ways that you can understand how the vessel goes and be able to get around and recanalize it. And this is another algorithm for treating more complex occlusions, like those that the wire goes through and the balloon goes through. Um, this is an area where microcasters work very well. The laser has been very useful. And essentially, there's nothing magic to it, but it is having an algorithm or a checklist that you can cross every time you run into the situation so you don't feel frustrated and out of options. So hybrid algorithm. As mentioned before, this is now what's used in the US for, most of the, for the most part, and increasingly in Europe, mainly uh, UK, Ireland, and now increasingly in other parts of Europe. And all that it tells you is that when you try to do these procedures, you start by taking pictures from both sides. That's called a dual injection. And then 
depending on the characteristics of the lesion, if you understand where it's starting, how long it is, how is the distal vessel, you either go on the front end or the back end. And the key part of this strategy is that if something doesn't work, you don't keep on doing it, you try to switch to something else that might be more successful. So we have this registry called the Progress CTO Registry. This has been going on now for four or five years. And um, we very recently got uh, approval here at uh, MHI, and it's now coming here to MHI. We also got a, a beginning grant from uh, Alina to be able to deploy the registry here. And we were able to recruit uh, Peter Tidy, who is sitting on the back uh, of the audience. So pl uh, please uh, have to welcome him, because Peter is our first uh, research fellow who just joined us last year from, from Hungary. Um, Peter worked um, with Dr. Imre Ungi, one of the best uh, city operators in Hungary, and he was uh, highly recommended to us, and he's been doing tremendous, tremendous work. However, at the same time, the team is still waiting in Dallas, so all these five people are still waiting in Dallas, getting things going, until we get the full RB approvals from the sites to move everything over here. But we're very, very excited that we're slowly moving into getting the registry here, and it now has more than 2,000 uh, CTO PCIs, 23 sites. We expanded internationally um, earlier this year, and um, it's been a tremendous experience and a lot of learning opportunity. As a few, as a few days ago, we had uh, five abstracts accepted at the Sky meeting in New Orleans coming up. I think we had probably, I think, 10 papers last year, 20, 30 abstracts, I forget the number, but it's been a very successful um, endeavor, and uh, we're very excited to have it here and keep on working on it. So here's some of the insights from the registry from the last year. This is, uh, at the time, had 1,600 lesions, success 89%, complications 2.7%. And what progress showed us is that you need all the techniques. You need the undergrade techniques, the retrograde techniques. You need everything to be able to recanalize those lesions. It doesn't matter if you have failed before. So it turns out the success in people who have and have not failed was similar. Now, of course, it depends on who failed. If it's an experienced operator, if Dr. Burke fails, it's a different thing than a less experienced operator. But the bottom line is that even the failed cases, we can very often recanalize them successfully. How about the AIDS? Are the very old lesions more than three, four, five years harder to recanalize? Not so. Although there's a trend for slightly less success, still pretty high success rate can be achieved in those very old lesions more than three to five years. How about intravascular imaging? to optimize the, the, the outcome and help us with crossing, it was used in 38% of uh, CTO PCIs. And uh, it was used mainly to optimize the stent, but it did, it did help with crossing the lesion in about a third of the times where it was used. The one thing that, that is, comes again and again from progress and from other registries is that the retrograde approach, which is going from the other vessel, is very effective very effective in recanalizing, at the same time, um, there are some issues with it. And safety is less than that of the undergrade approach. So you get success, of course, are much complex lesions. And you can get the success pretty high. However, the problem is that the maze, the major adverse events, are significantly higher with the retrograde. And that has to do with more myocardial infarction, more perforation requiring pericardiocentesis. The, the reason being, we are going through the so-called normal vessel that's sustaining the patient, and if things don't go well, then the patient can become hemodynamically unstable. We had a case um, a few weeks ago in which we were doing retrograde in a patient from out, referred from outside that ended up developing severe MR and had to be intubated and, and placed on impella until he eventually recovered, which again makes us appreciate having the collaboration with the heart failure department how to manage this very complex patients. But the lesson is that whenever we can go undergrade, Undergrade is the way to go. Of course, the complex cases are going to be much harder to go undergrade. This is an example of a retrograde. Actually, from a few days ago, we did this case with Dr. Burke. This was a patient that um, had, the, it's a 45-year-old, that presented last year with dissection and had his aorta replaced. At the time, the right coronary was dissected, so they had to put a graft, a vein graft, going to the right coronary. And as you can see here, he developed severe hemolysis, and on CT, he had this massive coronary saphenous vein graft aneurysm that um, Dr. Suraj actually went in and was able to wire this, despite all these loculations, and then place a cover stand, and by doing that, he was able to recanalize it. And the patient did very well. 
he more or less stopped. He did not have engine until a few months ago when he started having a lot of engine and limitations. And sure enough, unfortunately, the vein graft um, stand had closed, not uncommon with cover stands, which are bare metal stands in these uh, complex lesions. So he was sent to us for canalizing him. I spent a lot of time studying, studying the lesion. And we were plan the CT was extremely helpful, actually. However, the problem here is that the right coronary was not connected anymore to the new aorta. So going retrograde from the native vessel was not going to happen, so we had to fix the occluded vein graft. So we ended up trying undergrade, as I said, undergrade safely if we can do it, but it didn't work. Nothing would go forward. And then by going retrograde, we advanced the wire down the septals all the way to the distal right coronary artery. And then we're able to advance the wire all the way back in the right coronary into the vein graft and then back into the aorta. And then uh, by doing that, we were able to restore the canalize it. Uh, the patient did great. He went home the next day, and he's feeling um, much, much, much better. So again, there are some techniques that you want to use as little as you can, but Sometimes you just have to use them to be able to get a successful outcome. And retrograde is, um, is one of those techniques. How about outside the United States? This comes from the UK. That's the UK hybrid registry. James Pratt, um, Julian Strange, many of the very good operators there. 1,200 patients. The success first attempt was 79%. After second attempt, went all the way up to 90%. So the hybrid approach in action across, uh, across the Atlantic and very good results achieved in other centers as well. This was published about a month ago in JAC. This is a France, Netherlands, Belgium, and UK registry, 1,200 patients, and fairly similar results, 86% success, 2.6% complication rate. And once again, the same theme. You can get this done, but you need all the techniques, and you're able to go back and forth between those techniques to get things um, um, successfully done. Another common theme is that these advanced techniques, retrograde, dissection reentry, are more important when you have the more complex lesions. One way to understand how complex the lesions are is it's called the JCTO score. And the, more, the higher the score, the more complex, and that's where you need the more complicated approaches. Exact same thing was seen in, in progress CTO. However, even in the most complex cases, those with a JCTO score of 5, 78% or 4 out of 5, could be recanalized successfully doing CTO PCI. So with the current equipment, the current techniques, we can get fairly high success rate even in those very complex lesions. This is from a couple of years ago now, but still there is a big discrepancy. Although the experienced centers can get this done with 85, 90% success, that's the reality in the US, which is a success rate of 59%. And that's why many people come to other centers and are sent to other operators is because the overall success still remains low, and the complication rate is significantly higher. So there is a big gap from what can be done in experienced centers and what is actually done when you take the entire US in the NCDR registry. And, and what, can, what can we do for that uh, is something that is um, evolving. This was a paper from Ajay Kirtane on, in circulation about this complex procedures and lesions. And CTO is part of it, so are many other complex um, cases. And the bottom line is that these cases are not your standard PCI. And what you want to do is to have the different tools, equipment, and skills to be able to do those cases. So he provides an outline in this paper on techniques and skills that are needed to get this successfully done. But the bottom line is there are very few operators right now in the US and worldwide trained in these procedures. And can we help them train more? And ELM is a program from Sky called Emerging Leaders in Medicine, in which people who go on intervention after between three and 10 years out of fellowship, they get mentored by an experienced and well-established interventionist to become the future generation leaders. So the question is, can, should people get trained immediately after fellowship for these advanced procedures, or should they first go and practice for a few years, get their basic skills up, and then trying to learn CTO or complex cases. And actually, this has been the pathway that most of us have gone through. But things are changing now, more techniques, more equipment, and maybe there are different ways to do it. The problem is that right now, we have about 280 interventionalists graduating every year from uh, the US uh, training program. So a fairly large number of um, graduating interventionalists. 
However, how many fellowship programs are there for these advanced procedures? Four or five. So it's still very, very early. We're extremely happy that with, with Dr. Burke, we are starting this fellowship. We had interviews a few months ago, and uh, we just selected uh, our candidate who's going to start early in the summer, our first SIP fellow, and uh, uh, it's going to be a wonderful um, um, experience having the fellow over here. But this is a big need out there. By the way, these are fund, self-funded, so their institution pays for them to come and train at another institution, so it doesn't put any burden on, the, uh, on our system. However, it will be a tremendous resource, someone very focused and motivated in these complex procedures moving the, the field forward. There are many other resources. Um, these days, um, I'm working on the second edition of that uh, textbook of uh, CTO interventions, so I'm a lot of time on YouTube in case you have times to kill. However, we should not forget why we do these procedures. So starting with why is the key. And there has been some more understanding about the indications and the outcomes of the procedure. As I mentioned before, the number one reason for doing this is symptom improvement. We don't have any hard data that survival is improved, but we do have a lot of data that people do feel better once they get recanalized. This is from a registry called the Open CTO from Aaron Grant. I'm showing that over time, those who are successful have significant improvement in the Seattle Engine uh, Questionnaire quality of life in multiple different dimensions. Also, there is significant improvement in dyspnea. And what is interesting is that many of those patients don't have the classic angina, but they present mainly with dyspnea. And then the only way sometimes to find out is after you decanalize and they say, oh, well, the dyspnea is gone. They also have very commonly more depressive symptoms. This is from Mass General, from Farouk uh, Jaffer and Bobby Ye, showing that many of the patients who have CTOs have subclinical and clinical depression. And what is interesting is that the patients who have depression to start with, as measured by a questionnaire, are the ones more likely to get to feel better after their depression is, um, after their CTO is recanalized. We also do several um, cases for people who have recurrent arrhythmias. They have a recurrent ICD shocks, or for example, like this case, they come in in VT storm due to ischemia, and recanalizing them can help um, uh, resolve the arrhythmia. Last year, the EXPLORE trial came. EXPLORE was a trial done in Europe. It took seven years to enroll, and is the very first ever randomized trial of CTO-PCI versus medical therapy. The primary, it, it had people with uh, STEMI and concomitant CTO randomized to CTO-PCI or medical therapy, and then point was ejection fraction by MRI. Success was 73%, so a little low, but not too bad. However, there was absolutely no difference in the ejection fraction or the left ventricular and diastolic volume at four months. There are limitations, obviously, but the bottom line is, if you're doing this in the post-STEMI patient, you should not be doing it to improve ejection fraction because ejection fraction did not really change. And there is, again, controversy. If you, were you viable to start with, maybe you were not viable. There's controversy because 73 is less than 90% that can be done. But nevertheless, I think for most interventionalists, this is not something you do just to improve ejection fraction. This is something you do to improve patient symptoms. So why should you open a CTO? Symptoms is the number one thing. There are very rare cases in the symptoms are unclear and you do it for ischemia. What is typically seen is you come in and people say, I'm feeling okay, but then you put them on the treadmill and then two minutes later they stop because of chest pain or shortness of breath and they, and they have EKG changes. So the symptoms is something, of course, that you have to be validated. And then if the patient has multivessel disease that is complex, in general, bypass is the way to go. And CTO-PCI is just a tool that can be used and should be used in a wise manner. People who have complex disease, multivessel disease, and CTO bypass is the way to go Have many of those patients there. Some of those patients are poor surgical candidates, and that's when PCI of CTOs and non-CTOs has a role. And of course, it has a, a very important role if the patient has single vessel disease, with the classic example being the patient with single vessel RCA. The case I showed you, the vein graft to the PDA in the dissection patient, you would not send this patient for redo surgery for a right coronary artery esophagus vein graft. So this is a tool, like many other tools we have, and using it wisely 
can help have the better outcomes. So should a patient undergo CT or PCI? The answer is it depends, and it depends on the potential benefits and the potential risks. The benefits determ deter are determined by the symptoms to start with. So patient completely symptomatic, 10 minutes on the treadmill, maybe that's not for you. Patient with extent of ischemia and myocardial function, and of course the likelihood of success. If you have likelihood of success that is high, then you can adjust the amount of symptoms that you think is worth tackling. But also it depends on the risk, risk for complications, either short term or in the long term. And progress has been very instrumental last year, actually, kind of putting a number on those estimates and making it a little easier for decision making. So we have now the progress CTO score, which looks at four points, and then can give you an estimate of success. If you have uh, three or more points, you have 77% chance of success. If you have zero, you have 98% chance of success. But even more importantly, there is for complications. So it turns out that older age is associated with more complications. Many reasons, maybe more friable vessels, more calcified vessels, less tolerance to complications. It's unclear what exactly it is. But the older you get, then the complication risk goes up. The same for longer lesions and the same for using the retrograde approach. As I was telling you before, the retrograde is powerful but does have increased potential risk. So by pl plugging them all together, you can have an estimation for the procedural risk. So the 90-year-old woman who has this retrograde approach with a long CTO, then the risk is getting up there and you want to have a conversation with that patient and the family about what to expect and what not to. And all this, again, is available online. We have in the Progress CTO website where you can go and plug in all those numbers and get an, an estimate. Your success is going to be 90%. Complication rate is 4%. So the patient can make a better assessment about whether he wants that intervention or not. So finishing up, apart from the benefits from the patient, doing CTO PCI does help the interventional team become better. And there are many reasons why that is happening. One of them has to do with how you evaluate the angiogram. Uh, you become more careful and more patient looking at those lesions. Understanding the equipment, we use a lot of equipment for CTOs that then can be used in non-CTO interventions as well. You can treat complex lesions of various types, increases the volume, the workflow, makes you, for good or for worse, better at managing complications because CTO PCI does have more complications than the non-CTO PCI. You are more careful with radiation. It helps you join a community that has a lot of support. It's been tremendous working with Dr. Burke. Again, something happens, having someone to call on and get a second opinion. And very importantly, it makes you humble because no matter if you're the best operator in the world, you're going to have complications, you're going to have failures. And being able to work through these complications and failures and keep on learning and having good results, that's a very important part of being in this field. So in summary, there's a lot of evolution in the field of CTO PCI. There are new techniques, new equipment. And at experienced centers now, and I believe we are one of those centers, you can get high success, low complication rates with doing this procedure. However, of course, there's continued research and indication and outcomes. We do have an ongoing trial called Crossbos First that is happening right now and we're a center. And there's more trials coming up. And through Progress CTO and the future studies, I think we understand better when and how to get this accomplished. So thank you very much again for, your, uh, for being here this morning. Okay, so here's a question. How does the long-term success compare to the procedural success? And I didn't go over it, but this is an excellent question. Of course, getting the lesion open is one thing, but you want it to stay open, of course. And the answer is restenosis rates have been less than 10% in most series. Um, actually, the outlier is, was our study in Dallas that had high restenosis rate, but most, um, with, with second generation drug eluting stents, restenosis is less than 10%. There is a low risk for aneurysm formation with dissection techniques, but this is fairly low. Many of us do like to give prolonged dual and dipletal therapy. And that's uh, one of those things that is not scientifically very sound yet. There's not really hard data that giving long-term BAPT helps. But because we do place often 100 millimeters of stand in a coronary artery, uh, it makes sense to us and many of us do give if the patient is low bleeding risk. Uh, long-term uh, dual and dipletal therapy. What's the 
ECMO, but the question is what fraction needs some sort of hemodynamic support, whether it's balloon pump, impella, et cetera? That's an excellent question. Um, we have a paper on this right now from the registry. 3.8% received support, either prophylactic or doing crust. The major, actually, about, about a third was prophylactic, two thirds when things, something happened, a complication happened. So it's a fairly small proportion. However, it's been growing. I think part of the problem is that now, you know, the, the better you get, the better you should better get, because now you refer some patients are much more complex with baseline heart failure. Um, so the percentage is still low in the 3-4% range, but depending on the center, like a referral center, they probably have much higher support rate than, than another center. But I must say one of the eye-openers for me was having this collaboration, hopefully we'll have more of preemptive collaboration rather than after things happen. Um, but it's, it's one of those things, and many operators now suggest in the complex low ejection fraction patients, putting a swan in at baseline and monitoring the PA pressure so things start happening, then you have an early warning that something is wrong and you should take care of that. These are very complicated. They take a long time, presumably. And how has the cath lab adjusted to that? And then secondarily, if you could tell us about what's your new monitoring procedure for the operator and for patients relative to radiation. So um, on, the, on the cath lab side, the, the way we're dealing with this, I mean, you're absolutely right. These cases can be quick, can be long, can be very long. Um, the case I showed you, the one with the ECMO, it took seven hours. So it was a full day procedure, essentially. The, the way around it is we only schedule up to two, two CTOs a day, so we don't schedule more than that. So in the previous lab, I would do three. I think two is a good compromise because then if things go south in one, then you don't have three patients waiting, then you're able to handle it better. Um, the, other, the other one is um, uh, to involve people who are more interested in that. So some techs are particularly interested in these complex cases and actually want to be part of the cases. And, uh, Dr. Burke can speak uh, more to this as well. But um, having the people who actually want to be there versus the ones who don't. I think most people actually have been fairly good for it. So although some cases have been long, for the most part, I've been, I've been um, you know, very uh, grateful that people have been very, very supportive of that. Now, don't ask me at 10 o'clock at night, but most of the time. Uh, in terms of the radiation, so in, in, in my previous lab, we had a brand new system. We never got more than two grades. Unfortunately, our labs are still in the process of being uh, um, uh, changed. And actually, this year, we have like two or three labs being changed. And that's going to help a lot. I think the systems we have now give a little more radiation. And the way to get around it is don't step on the pedal unless you have to. So the classic things that we always do, but are particularly important. Low magnification, try to do it in the very low mag that gives less radiation to the patient. And try to rotate the image intensifier so it's not on the same location of the back that this happens. We did have some patients in whom uh, we reach five, six gray, and usually eight is the cutoff you have to stop, but haven't had a case where it goes more, more than that. But I think what's going to be the big solution to that is a new system comes in, it will be low radiation system, and then we'll do our cases there, that, that, that would help a lot. In, in the previous lab, the limiting factor was no longer radiation, it was contrast. So when the machine is, is new and the low radiation machine, actually you have a, a different perspective on how you do this procedure. and does that predict clinical outcome? Yeah, that's an excellent question about viability. Actually, in that patient that I showed, um, um, we did one, and that showed that the, ter the territory was viable. And here's my take on this. If the patient is having a pretty clear cut territory of CTO, no other major lesions, and has classic angina, I, I don't do viability study, because I figure, you know, having chest pain, that's got to be. The ones I, I think is important, are the ones that have multiple multiple lesions or occlusions before going for a very complex case. That's the ones I think you're more likely to understand what is um, what is going on. So I don't do this very routinely, but like in the patients, especially the ones with the low ejection fraction and unclear whether this is the culprit or there are multiple potential culprits, these are the ones that 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 we do viability. Steve, patient for CTO um, opening. I was curious as to what patient-reported health status measures you're capturing as part of your registry, and at what points in time. Excellent. So actually, it's a big gap, 
and I'm so glad you brought that up because <laughs> we needed some support on this. Um, so, so the Redis is observational, and part of the reason um, it's been set up like this is because on a previous study I did, the FDA came in and says, "Well, you have to get concern from all these people because you know you're doing follow-up in a non-standard way." So we don't have any questionnaire specifically built up into this. Um, we could make it standard of care. I think it would be good to capture that as part of, and I know that this could be a big part for quality and, and um, an assessment, and would love to, to talk to you more about this. But right now, all we're capturing is what is on the record, which is, do you feel better or not? And that's fairly crude, obviously. I mean, it's not any elaborate like Seattle Engine or questionnaires, but we'd love to have more, more of that in some of those cases. All of the data to date, and this is actually old data prior to, you know, the higher success rates and the much better long-term success rates with second-generation DES showed a dramatic improvement in symptoms and exercise tolerance in those folks. Not only what's procedural success, but what are the differences in procedural success and long-term improvement in symptom burden? It would be helpful to have that captured in granular granular data to move the field forward beyond those aspects. And I think there are approaches to do it that would fit in what we want to do to assess quality and improve generally um, in a way that's not burdensome. And we can talk offline. So, perfect. Thank you. Anil, yeah. Anil, sir, kudos to you and Nick for uh, championing this program. The question I have is what goes in your head as far as guardrails go to staff case? I mean, you know, you have the contrast issue, you know, the radiation issue. What else is going on in your head? You know, when to stop? Yeah, it's a great point. So the number one thing is the complication happens. If the complication happens, most cases you stop. For example, we were doing a case, actually, that's the one uh, who had Dr. Ekman involved. So the, we did the case. There was very hard. I'd go down the Lima, down the septal, and we're actually about to do a reverse card and finish. The guy goes in pulmonary edema who were that close from competing a very complex CTO. Well, you know what, patient life is, you know, dead patient, the successful open CTO, probably not the best. So complication is the big thing. Everyone agrees, I guess, on that part. Um, the second thing, in terms of the logistics, it used to be more than eight gray, we stop, unless we've crossed and we're standing. Eight gray is pretty firm cutoff. The second thing is um, um, uh, the, the patient, so that's why we have a good understanding before. There are these patients who come to us who traveled from a different state, and they are desperate. So your threshold is a little higher there. You don't want to give up as easy. You want to keep on going as long as it's safe, even if you get, let's say, seven gray, I mean, you still keep on going. The, the latest, as I mentioned before, my, my limiting stack has been mainly the contrast. Um, you know, getting you know, the four times GFR, a little flexible if the function is okay, but the contrast, you get like five, 600 ml, that's when you start thinking about, it's been the most limiting, limiting factor. What is amazing, though, is, uh, sometimes you never know. I mean, last case, last week, we were in, what, two, three hours, and we were actually not about two or three gray, but we were getting tired. And the last, let's say one last attempt, and it worked. So it's one of those things that having the stamina ongoing, that's what gets you successful in some of those cases. So I would say complication, no question. Contrast radiation, another thing. And then the balance, how much contrast radiation depends on the indication, how how much the patient needs it and how much is willing to take of that. It's, it's a fine art. It's not, you know, clear cut for everyone, but um, uh, these are the guidelines we typically use. Okay, well, thank you very much again.